Internet freedom for global development. It is expected that a few years from now the number of people online will have risen from slightly less than 2 billion to 5 billion. Access and connectivity have empowered countries and communities in a multitude of ways and have also contributed to leveling the playing field for development, economic development as well as political development. If new technologies and the Internet itself have been the platforms for innovation, this would not have been possible without the mother of innovation, freedom. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Bild for that uh, very inspiring speech that we just heard. Uh, while uh, our panelists uh, are welcome to sit down, I think we have one more panelist uh, we're waiting for. Um, I'd just uh, like to say a few words about this first opening session. Uh, we're here to discuss and make the case for why uh, internet freedom and an open internet is uh, the free flow of information is important, not only for human rights, but ultimately for global development. Without digital no networks on which people's rights to speech, assembly, association, and privacy are respected, um, the world is not going to be as prosperous as uh, we would like it to be. Uh, we will begin with some remarks from uh, Minister Gunilla Carlson. Minister for International Development Cooperation, and we will then go on to the panel who I will reduce, introduce after her remarks are finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what a fantastic gathering of people we have here today. Internet activists, IT specialists, business representatives, professors, telecom operators, human rights defenders, development experts, even some politicians and diplomats. And that is just to mention a few. However, most of those people attending the Stockholm Internet Com Forum aren't even here. They are out there somewhere following us on the web. And when you think about that, it's really amazing. Anywhere in the world, a person with a computer and an internet connection can not only watch us, but also actually take part in today's conference. For many of us here, the internet and its possibilities have become an obvious and natural as the air we breathe. But at the same time, many people, too many, can't even take it for granted as a fundamental as water. As Minister for International Development Cooperation, my work is centered in the middle of these two extremes. However, there is nothing that says they have not to be, to be mutually exclusive. Just because you lack clean water doesn't mean you're not streaming the latest episode of 30 Rock on your computer and then tweeting about it. And just because you live in a slum doesn't mean you're not hooked up with the rest of the world. We live in a complex time in which many of our perceived notions of poverty no longer apply. This is something we all must bear in mind when talking about development. Now I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts about the importance of internet freedom for multifaceted development and what we can and must do to help those who are fighting for freedom and democracy. The internet has revolutionized our economies and societies. It radically shrinks the distance between people, businesses, the scientific community and governments all around the world. This revolution has given us a fantastic new opportunities. The internet as a platform for innovation and growth, but also an important platform for democracy. Those of us who are convinced that human development depends on individual expression of new ideas clearly understand the value of a free and open internet. The insight is also reflected in one of the Millennium Development Goals, Goal 8. It sets out to make available the benefits of new technologies in developing countries and to increase the number of internet users. 
Information and communication technologies are the enablers that allow societies to prosper, that allow modern healthcare, education, banking, trade and communication to exist. If developing countries are to play their full role in the global economy, they too must have access to the technologies that define our reality today. In our efforts to eradicate poverty, let us not forget the goal A target of making the benefits of new technologies available, especially information and communication technologies. This target carries a vision of development as something beyond the absence of hunger. It is a vision of freedom, growth and innovation that puts the individual first in the general development of mankind. We should remind ourselves of the commitment to turn the digital divide into a digital opportunity, particularly for those who risk being left behind and even further marginalized. Bridging the digital divide means ensuring digital inclusion. This in turn requires people having access to an effective use of the range of digital media, communication platform and devices for informational management and processing. I believe it is important to underline that access is not only a question of physical possibilities to connect to the internet or even access to skills necessary to use new technologies. It is not only about availability and affordability. Access to and use of the internet are becoming more and more significant for the full enjoyment of human rights. The right to freedom of expression, the right to education, the right to freedom to peaceful assembly and association, the right to take part in government of a country, the right to work, and so on. Today, access to and the crea creative use of the internet are inevitably priority to anyone concerned with human development due to its integral relationship to all these human rights. And dear friends, in addressing the issue of access, we should always keep in mind that the gap in access between the developed and the developing world is only one of many divides and often a symptom of underlying problems rather than the core problem. One of the underlying problems is of course the inherent lack of respect for human rights that characterizes some nations' approach to modern communication technologies. By being the largest and potentially most inclusive communication arena that has ever existed, the internet fosters freedom of expression on a global scale. Those who want to exclude their population from this arena are trembling with fear. Countries where regimes limit or prohibit their citizens' access to the internet, these are the black holes of the internet. Earlier, Carl mentioned China, but in Iran, internet censorship has been a reality for some time, and even more so since the disputed presidential elections in 2009. For instance, Iran now blocks access to both Gmail and Google, and for a reason beyond my comprehension, the official website for the upcoming London Olympics. There are also indications that Iran is pursuing a plan for a clean internet, in effect an Iran, Iranian intranet controlled by the government. In the report, Freedom on the Internet 2011, the organization Freedom House lists five countries that are in a particular risk of suffering setbacks related to internet freedom. Thailand, Russia, Jordan, Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Another example in the Freedom House report is Pakistan, where temporary blocks have been common in recent years. In 2010, a new interministerial com committee for the evaluation of websites were established to flag sites for blocking based on vaguely defined offenses against the state or religion. And certainly some of these countries that I mentioned aren't that we would normally call development countries. But this is only true if you take a narrow view on poverty. Because poverty, the way the Swedish government sees it, it is not only a lack of food or water or income. It is just a ma it's just as much a lack of freedom and the right to express oneself freely. In most of the countries where access to the internet is limited, it is a criminal offence to express oneself via the internet. As a persecution of reform-minded people on the internet grows, 
our duty as human rights defenders becomes a duty to defend a free and open internet. In our age of instant communication, it is futile to try to prevent the dissemination of views and contacts by closing down the internet or mobile phone services. Therefore, my government has clearly stated that extensive closure of the internet is, in fact, a violation of the freedom of expression and information established in Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. But it's not enough for Sweden and others to express their dismay. We need a broader agreement and understanding among governments that freedom of the internet is a rule, not the exception. Here, governments need to do more, and we politicians need to realize that no one, not even a fully developed democracy, is immune to the temptation of controlling and limiting access to the internet. It is evident that today's information and communication technologies provide new potential to modernize our development efforts in a very substantial way. These tools can be used to promote the cause of democracy and human rights, to provide independent sources of information, to hold leaders accountable to their citizens, to serve as a means to connect citizens both throughout the country and in diaspora communities, and to expose corruption. These are liberation technologies, symbols of a world that has changed forever. This is why freedom of the internet will remain a priority issue for the Swedish government. The role of information and communication technology in today's freedom struggle ranges from creation of alternative channels to government-controlled media to the use of social media in monitoring human rights abuses and mobilizing support for democracy. The Arab Revolution has shown how ICT and social media applications can create new opportunities for citizens to mobilize, increase their influence and demand accountability from their leaders. Exploring and investing in ICT is key for increased openness and transparency worldwide. We can never accept people being thrown into prison merely because they voice their opinion on the internet. The time has passed when a people's legitimate claim to justice and welfare can be silenced by blocking their freedom of expression and their freedom of assembly. And as long as there are countries where the internet is shut down or censored, there is a scope for increased ICT support to facilitate the free flow of information and so promote domestically driven democratic change. We have an obligation to support those who risk their lives fighting for values that we share and take for granted. The events in North Africa and the Middle East represent a strong call to governments and donors truly committed to democracy and human rights. And this deserves our admiration and respect, but it also calls us to take action. Dear friends, in 2009, as a complement to the traditional democracy assistance, the Swedish government launched a special initiative for democratization and freedom of expression. This initiative gave us the means to rapidly support human rights activists and agents for democratic change in a new and more direct way, not least through ICT. The Swedish government recently decided to adapt a new strategy for democratization and freedom of expression with a budget of 215 million crowns for 2012. The strategy prioritizes the use of ICT and innovative technology in the service of freedom. Many of the projects that we supported in 2011 were in the Middle East and North Africa, and we will continue this support in 2012 and onwards. And I would like to take the opportunity to give you an idea of the kind of projects that we are supporting via our modern agency, CEDA. First, we have the project Imedan, sorting, translation and disseminating citizens' reporting in the Arab region. The purpose of the Imedan is to strengthen citizen journalism in the MENA region. This is done by training bloggers and by building up portals for the promotion of activist bloggers in cooperation with local 
progressive media actors. The first phase of Imedan focused on Egypt, but has now expanded to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Morocco, and several other countries. Secondly, we support an international NGO called Tactical Technology Collective, or Tactical Tech for short. They train human rights defenders, democracy activists, and journalists in IT security, ICT technology, and efficient method of bypassing censorship, filtering, and infiltration. The goal of the project is to have 20,000 trained agents of change. We also give support to similar projects managed by, among others, Freedom House, the Tour Project, and Civil Rights Defenders. Many, if not most, of the brave men and women we are trying to help take great risk and make even greater sacrifices in the name of freedom. We owe them our support. Well, dear friends, one of the most fundamental obstacles to poverty reduction and achieving the goal of equitable and sustainable global development is repression. As I said before, poverty is not only a lack of income and material resources. Poverty is also lack of freedom, security, and the power to influence policy and shape the decisions that affect one's life. Every person has the right to live his or her life in dignity and in freedom. And taking freedom seriously means always putting the individual first, before the state. That is why the Swedish government have made it our business to help those who fight for and believe in freedom and democracy. At the beginning of my speech, I mentioned water. The way I see it, water and the internet have quite a lot in common. First of all, every person should have unlimited access to them. Secondly, they are both fantastic mediums for communicating, trading, and for making a living. Third, they are a lot of fun. Fourth, and this may be the most important similarity, they both have an extraordinary ability to make their way into the smallest of cracks, be it into rocks or dictatorships. And as we've seen once, they are in. Anything can happen. That ability, that power, is what makes the internet such an amazing instrument of change. Dear friends, where there is water, there is life. And where is, there is the internet, there is hope. Let's make sure everybody has plenty of both. Thank you so much for your attention. And thank you again for coming to Stockholm. Stockholm that we used to call the capital of water, where we together now increase freedom in a globalized and new world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Carlson. We will now move on to our panel, uh, which uh, is, is really a distinguished group of people. Um, I will just introduce them very quickly. You can read their bios in, in the program, so I won't read through all their many impressive accomplishments. Uh, but just very quickly, uh, on my immediate right, we have uh, Henriette Esterhuizen, who is exec Executive Director of the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, to her right, we have Mr. Frank LaRue, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Uh, to his right, we have Marie Tishak, uh, who is a member of the European Parliament and who has been really championing, uh, championing uh, the issues of, of internet freedom worldwide. And last but not least, to her right is Mr. Sunit Singh Tuli, uh, who is president and CEO of Data Wind uh, in India. Uh, and uh, so we're going to get, I think, a, a broad overview of different perspectives on the relationship uh, between the future of global prosperity and 
a free and open internet. And we really have come a long way, it, it, it seems to me, since uh, in, in 2005, I, I actually attended the World Summit for Information Society in Tunisia, uh, where the internet was censored and where dissidents themselves were unable to attend the event. And uh, there was a panel uh, that was sponsored by HIVOS, the, the Dutch NGO, I see there's some people here today. It, it was called uh, Expression Under Repression, and I was asked to moderate this panel. And uh, the Tunisian government tried to get the panel taken off the schedule because they said it was off topic. The topic of the NGO forum was ICT for development. And their argument was that freedom of expression had nothing to do with development. Um, we ended up holding the panel only thanks to diplomatic intervention and uh, a uh, Tunisian state journalist got up and gave us a long lecture about how we were arrogant Westerners lecturing the developing world about freedom of expression when we didn't understand that uh, uh, you know, there are more important things like food, clothing and shelter that had to be resolved before anybody could talk about freedom of expression. And so I turned to our panel. Uh, uh, which included a, a gentleman from China, someone from Malaysia, some, someone from Iran, and, and a gentleman from Zimbabwe. And uh, I, I asked them if they'd like to respond. And a gentleman named Tarai Maduna from Zimbabwe kind of had the ultimate answer, which was, without freedom of expression, I can't talk about who's stealing my food. <laughs> uh, and that kind of shut everyone up. Uh, but, but, but I think that, that I wanted to just tell that anecdote because I, I think it really sums up why we're here and, and why these issues are so connected. Um, but I want to start first uh, with a question um, from Mr. Frank LaRue. But actually, before I do that, I just want to remind everyone that this panel is uh, being webcast live on the internet, that there are people watching it around the world, and I welcome all of you around the world watching the panel to tweet your reactions and questions. And uh, after, after I've had an opportunity to ask each panelist a question, uh, then uh, we're really hoping to have an interactive discussion, not only with people in the room who are welcome either to uh, submit comments and questions through Twitter, or I, th I believe there will be a roving microphone, but we'll also be turning to our curators um, who will be uh, bringing us questions and uh, comments from around the internet. So we're hoping to make this as interactive as possible. So, so please, if something comes to mind, if you don't want to wait uh, in, until you know, you're, you're, you're called upon, feel free to tweet it and we'll try and get it into the mix. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. LaRue, um, you have really over the, over the past year been emphasizing the link between freedom of expression and access. And despite the fact that some people claim that access and freedom of expression are, are not linked, um, you are arguing that they very much are. And I'm wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. This is exactly the point I made in my report to the General Assembly in October last year. And I did it because of what was mentioned by the two ministers today. I did it because you have to link the possibility of exercising a right to all the preconditions. When Gutenberg invented the printing press, it only made sense to have books if people would learn how to read and write, which at that stage was an enormous task. Today, to have the freedom of internet, and as Minister Bilt said, the more freedom in the internet, the more democratic a nation is. But to have that freedom on the internet means that people should have access to internet and to reach uh, all content. And I think this is, this is crucial. Now, of course, there was people, I think we have gone beyond that step and there were people very critical of my position at the beginning because they were saying you're dealing with an economic issue. And I said not, not entirely. Access to internet has two, two dimensions. One is the political dimension. There has to be free access to all content with no censorship. And this deals with democracy, with the openness of a society. And the more open a society is, the broader a democratic regime will have and the more development it have. But secondly, it does deal with the economic issue. It deals with the infrastructure, access to connectivity, access to software, to hardware, to the equipment. And as the Minister for Development said before, this is crucial because many people said, first you have to deal with access to water and then with access to internet. And I said, you struggle for water if you can express yourself. Otherwise, how will you raise your voices? And people understood that point. And it was very clear 
that in all societies there are alternative mechanisms. Africa itself was one of the key continents in the consultations we did with the support of Sweden, by the way, around the world, was very important to see how in communities where there was no electricity, people were still able to recharge their mobile smartphones and with that access internet and communicate themselves. So there is a solution when there is a will. And this was crucial for them not only to be informed, but also to express themselves freely, to have access to education, to have access to free association, to exercise the cultural diversity around the world, and specifically to exercise the right to develop. And I think that in the future, we won't be able to talk about economic and social development without access to internet. That's a very important point. Now, Ms. Schock, um, you have been campaigning particularly uh, on the whole issue that relates to the export of surveillance and censorship technology by Western companies um, to particularly authoritarian regimes around the world. Uh, and uh, you, you've been calling for more regulation and also more responsibility by companies. Um, and, and this does seem to be kind of one of these chicken and the egg issues that when, uh, when governments and when companies are thinking about the, the short-term interest, um, of, of course, the effect, the long-term impact on the openness and freedom of the internet is perhaps not considered. Um, whereas it's in, in, in a way a little bit of a sustainability issue as far as the open and free internet is concerned. That if everybody's only thinking about short-term economic development, short-term bottom line, they may be doing things that are gonna hurt the long-term openness of the internet and thus also just hurting this entire platform on which prosperity and development ultimately depends. And so how do we get both governments and companies to think in a more long-term way, to, to think about the internet, you know, not only about short-term profit and what am I going to make in terms of what I'm selling or what I'm complying with in a certain market, but really think about the need to keep the internet open and free if the value of the entire network is to be maintained. Well, thank you. I think that sustainable vision is really important. Um, and uh, for some businesses, the case for an open internet is the business case. But when we're talking about these surveillance uh, technology systems, effectively, uh, these are not companies which necessarily benefit from openness, but rather feed off the need to secure and control by authoritarian, but not always authoritarian uh, regimes. And I work in the European Union, it's known to be a bureaucratic um, um, organization and uh, we have rules for almost everything. The export of, export of toys, the import of water, tomatoes, cucumbers, you name it. And there's no regulation when it comes to uh, the export of these very, very aggressive technological systems. And I think that is uh, a reflection of um, a lack of catching up with the rules uh, in relation to the development of technologies. Uh, we see this in many uh, aspects uh, of this this uh, field of technology where the developments are so rapid and democratic decision making uh, takes a little bit longer uh, oftentimes but it's high time that we on the EU level and I feel very strongly about this being on the EU level um, catch up with these uh, technological developments and ensure transparency so that we know who is exporting what to whom and that we hold companies accountable. And we can also do something on the incentive side, for example, by um, looking at companies who may also bid on tenders in our own societies, who uh, would like to uh, work in government uh, projects, who we could then ask not to at the same time uh, export these surveillance systems to the most authoritarian regimes. Uh, and the same we could do uh, in looking at, for example, uh, grants or development funds that go to uh, governments of third countries uh, to see if we can put in criteria that actually respect human rights. Uh, I think it's really important that we don't look at internet freedom in isolation uh, and that if we indeed want to prioritize it, as has been said by, by everyone here, uh, we can't just look at internet uh, freedom and technology related issues, but it has to be a mainstream priority throughout government. And I think that that's one of the struggles that governments have to deal with, is to align their different departments and their different sectors uh, to get behind uh, this goal 
if we want to be sustainable. That's, I think, really encapsulates uh, the issue uh, really well. Mr. Tooley, you're an entrepreneur, you're a businessman. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the nature of the internet, whether it's free and open or not, how that affects the ability of businesses um, to, to actually succeed. I, I think it's, uh, you know, beyond question that restrictions to internet freedom have a direct economic impact. It, and it's not just that these restrictions uh, create aspersions in governments and, and you know, uh, affect businesses and business decisions if they would invest in those markets. But I think that it is the sort of short-term and short-sighted views that governments would have that these restrictions are as simple and as limited as blocking keywords. We think that, that it, it's a lot more uh, sort of beyond that. Uh, if, you, if you think of restrictions on social networking in certain markets, those markets have ignored the collaborative efforts of social networking and you know how those social networking environments are now generating potentially billions of dollars of uh, economic improvements and innovation in markets that are open to those. Um, so I'll give you a, a quick anecdote in, in a personal experience uh, way back when. Uh, back in 1996, uh, we used to do some R&D in India. And one night I got a call from, uh, I was back home in Canada, and I, and I got a call from uh, the wife of uh, my senior manager in the factory and said that the customs people have raided and have arrested him uh, with a thousand violations of, uh, uh, of smuggling. And uh, so it was a big concern for us. The violations were because R&D teams were based in Canada and R&D teams were based in India and they would do FTP uploads and downloads of software every day. And customs decided that this exchange of information was circumventing customs procedures. So when they think of restrictions and they don't understand technology associated with it, that has other implications, has other impacts. The result was we shut down R&D in India and we moved it out of there. So uh, these kind of approaches that, that assume that simple restrictions on keywords is all that they're doing, uh, somebody was recently arguing with me and said, look, we're just trying to maintain moral values for society. Um, I think they're short-term viewed, so they're short-sighted, uh, and they don't understand sort of the long-term impact of technology and, and how that's coming through. More and more studies continue to show that you know improvement in internet penetration and improvement in in the freedom of the internet are reflected in the sizes of economies. Um, you know, you, you you can do a very straight study: internet penetration to GDP uh, uh, to uh, you know goes across the way. India highlights on a regular basis that a, a 10 percent improvement in internet penetration is a country with less than. 10% people using the internet, a 10% improvement has a 1% improvement in GDP. You know, so what happens in an economy like India if half a billion people get on the internet over the next few years and have open, easy access? I, I think uh, a very important point has been raised uh, by my colleague on the panel about access. A and I, I think that it's important that affordability on devices and content and applications and access is, is essential. And it's important to the implementation of uh, the freedom of the internet. And those issues, of course, are often more difficult to deal with with Western governments than than sort of the just general principles of, of freedom of expression because of the corporate interests, uh, of course. That uh, 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 yeah. th th they are, and and you know, uh, I think a very important point was was made that today we restrict. Um, export of military equipment into authoritarian regimes. But, you know, we don't look at the impact of restricting internet in those regimes. You know, we're propagating the same kind of restrictions uh, as if we were, you know, allowed more guns into uh, dictators' mm -hmm. hands. All right. So, last but not least, 
Henriette Esterheisen, um, you've been working for quite a long time as, as the head of APC um, with civil society organizations around the world on issues related to free expression, access, uh, social justice, and ICT. Um, and I, I guess one, one of the questions is, in, in all of this mix, what role could civil society be playing that it's not playing? Or, or how do we ensure that civil society is getting enough of, um, I, I think, the voices of citizens and the concerns of citizens heard as various agreements are being made, as, as various protocols are being made, particularly on the global scale, as we're trying to figure out what are the policies and practices that are going to best facilitate a free and open global internet. How do we ensure that the interests of civil society groups, sometimes who are not represented by their governments at all, uh, and, and not, nece not necessarily served by um, you know, the, the, the corporate interests that uh, are more easily heard. H how do we ensure that these voices uh, and concerns um, have enough influence as we shape policies and practices going forward? Um, it's a tough question, actually. But I think I'll, I'll, I'll address it and perhaps by going back a little bit. And I think that um, as many speakers have indicated, um, freedom is both a driver of development as well as, a, as an outcome of, of development. And I think one, one of the issues which relates directly to civil society is what Frank referred to as the preconditions. But I also want to refer to the post-conditions. I think as we've seen from the, the, the MENA revolutions, that um, it's not just a challenge to get to the point where you have internet freedom or any uh, or political freedom, it's a challenge to maintain it. And to maintain that, you need institutions, you need rule of law, you need watchdogs, you need political diversity, media diversity. And, and these are contextual conditions that exist in the online world, but in the offline world. And in fact, that are, um, to be sustainable, really have to be very strongly embedded in the offline world. And I think that's where civil society becomes really a vital voice. And, and I think it's challenging for civil society, which traditionally has been organized, working in quite old-fashioned um, ways of getting constituencies together, developing positions, doing advocacy, to operate in this, this new governance domain, which is energized by citizen activism on the one hand, um, where crowdsourcing is the, you know, is, is the common wisdom. And, and, and so often those individual voices are sometimes more dynamic and, and more relevant than the voices of traditional organized civil society. But at the same time, when it comes to to um, operating in this institutional sphere, um, which is the sphere, I think, where we do get sustainable democracy um, um, created. Um, um, their role is absolutely essential. Um, and I think uh, um, what has been really challenging, I think, for many people in this room who have been operating in the internet governance context, um, where we talk about multi-stakeholder policy participation, um, is really how, in this context, we have any real influence. And I think, and I think that you know, we uh, you talked about the vision and 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 the importance of having a, a long-term vision. It's absolutely true, but we also know that not everyone has a long-term vision. And often, um, um, you know, to be profitable, you have to have a short-term vision and a long-term vision. And often those visions actually do conflict with freedoms. And I think that's one of the, the challenges that we have in the world of, of multi-stakeholder internet governance, where we have often the assumption that we have a common vision. But in fact, the vision is a little bit more complex <laughs> and, and diverse than that. And, and so I think for civil society, it's quite difficult because they are the voice um, that represents the public interest, but they do not have the power um, that either governments or the corporate sector have in this domain. So it's absolutely vital um, how to be effective. I'm not sure. I think it's become increasingly challenging. Um, and I think civil society is, is, is responding well to that challenge. 
but um, I think um, not well enough. Thank you. Uh, before we open up, um, Minister Carlson, I'd, I'd like to, to pick up on, on a couple of points that, that were raised, um, uh, and I, I think a lot of people would be interested to, to hear your views. Um, Maricha mentioned um, a couple of ideas uh, about how to address the problem um, of particularly surveillance and censorship equipment uh, that is being exported uh, to governments that are, are going to use it clearly for repressive purposes. And she mentioned that uh, government tender systems uh, should incorporate requirements on companies receiving the tender uh, in, in terms of their practices uh, abroad, and that also the, the, the grant making and development aid process should include requirements about internet openness uh, and free expression on the internet. Um, and I'm wondering uh, about your response to that in, in terms of whether you think this is something that uh, the Swedish government might be able to do. First, when it comes to the export control and the role of European Parliament, European legislation, as well as national legislation and behaviour, it is something that I think one should think about because it's also about security these days. It's not only hard security, it's also soft security. So I think it's a relevant question. What I, though, have focused most on is how we can support the freedom fighters to avoid these risks that already are there out there. But when it comes to the development aspect and how we can work with those poor people concerned in many countries that have not the full enjoyment of all freedoms. And many times lack of freedom goes together with poverty. And I'm one of those ministers that I'm not so afraid about what's traditionally called conditionality. I think we must be much more open with those countries where we are having partnerships to say that you can't have development in a globalized, digitalized world without understanding that the need of water is as important as the use of the internet. And to have this integral thinking. And thereby you can also address the question about freedom of the internet and security. I hope. But of course that means that we act differently. You mentioned civil society. Yes, it is a modern. We have to work differently. But also that governments in development need also to be good to put these things in the actually the front of our work ahead. And here it takes some time also for us as traditional donors to adapt. And that's why I'm pretty proud about what we have been doing so far, because by thinking about what's happening, also to trying to reshape development assistance as we see it. Uh, and uh, I think this is a very challenging work, <laughs> but it has helped us a lot to think actually also about individuals and what is poverty about. Makes a lot of sense. So we are going to, since we, we've got, uh, um, I guess, about uh, 35 minutes or so remaining in this session, uh, we're, we want to open this up to the discussion as, as quickly as possible. I see a hand going up already. <laughs> oh, two. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, and uh, so I think we have a roving microphone. Um, while the mic, uh, let's, the, I saw that hand first and then we'll go to this gentleman second. Uh, and meanwhile, while the microphones are getting to the people, um, I would like to ask our digital cur curators, uh, Pernilla That's and Joachim, uh, if, if there are any Thank burning you. issues coming from Twitter yes, that we should you. first address. Thank you. <laughs> Activity. There is a lot of activity on Twitter, and not too surprising, perhaps. And first, inside the room, people are tweeting, and it's obvious that everyone is very happy with what's happening on stage and what the panel says and what the introductory remarks were all about. But they're also very unhappy about the Wi-Fi here. So I've been asked to inform you that while you all drink your coffee, uh, the technicians are going to do a massive reboot and we should be back with one gigabit per second after coffee. So let's hold our thumbs for that. So, yeah. <laughs>
Um, and outside the room, while giving the topic on stage, the, the main discussion, of course, is about the corporate sector. And, and uh, I, I see two big trends. One is the question about what the civil society can do to, to push corporations in the right direction. And the other one is, to quote Elastigirl, can we please focus on the buyers of surveillance equipment with telcos in cahoots with regimes, for instance? Supply is driven by demand. So where do we push? What corporations do we actually push? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to also come back to the point that was made about civil society, and it's also reflected in the comments on Twitter. Uh, don't sell yourself short. I think civil society, as well as journalists, investigative journalists and academics, uh, have been very, very important and crucial, actually, in uh, moving the frontier forward. And we will have to uh, work together at this very decisive moment to prioritize. I think all of us in this room have come a long way from feeling like we were working in a small niche to finding the subjects that we work on sort of in the headlines of, of the news and in the uh, political agendas in a sometimes very controversial uh, places. And I honestly think this is a decisive moment where civil society uh, and uh, government and where possible uh, businesses need to prioritize together uh, to look at it from a global perspective because we have a lot of things we can work on together. Um, about the uh, buyers, um, that's really important and there also civil society is essential to share stories from on the ground. We all have a tendency to be kind of reactive. Uh, everyone's focusing on North Africa and the Middle East after the uprisings uh, in the Arab world and it's very understandable, I do the same. But I think we should all look at where the next um, front line is. Countries that are not uh, at, the, at the core of our focus now. Um, I'm thinking of a number of African countries, but also Central Asian countries. Uh, and there are places around the world where uh, we need activists and civil society uh, to share the experiences on the ground, to know what impact uh, these surveillance systems and other technologies that are exported have. Uh, they are often bought by governments or government services uh, of different kinds or sometimes state-owned companies. And uh, on the one hand, of course, we can try to influence that demand. But on the other hand, I do think that it is uh, high time that we set uh, laws that actually limit what is uh, tolerable uh, for EU companies, uh, as I work in the EU, but I think the same should go for US-based uh, companies and other um, areas where we can have influence on what is actually allowed to be exported. Uh, the demand might, might be there from repressive regimes uh, till the end of time because they will always seek to control uh, their populations and are very much afraid of, of speech, access to information uh, and the opportunity to, uh, to freely assemble. So um, personally I think we should start where we can, uh, which is also by, by looking at what is actually uh, no longer going to be tolerated to be exported. So the first question is, if you could please just identify yourself briefly. Good morning, my name is Mohammed El Abdullah and I'm a human rights activist from Syria. My question is it's on the same point exactly, but it's directed to Ms. Clarsson. It's about uh, Sweden keeps Syria Telecom's firm of the EU sanctions. And let me quote Minister uh, Carl Bildt a little bit here from Reuters. It's article in December 2nd, 2011, saying, uh, Minister Carl told Reuters that telephone networks were vital for op uh, opposition of, of the Syrian government to communicate and called suggestion in Swedish media that Sweden had acted to protect Ericsson's interest as ignorant. In, in 2011, in December, the EU was proposing a new package of sanctions and thought including the telecommunications firm in Syria and Sweden vetoed that package and they kept those firms out of the of the sanctions i i hardly take uh, <coughs> excuse me i highly take the comments of uh, foreign minister uh, as accurate as possible but uh, we had the same argument with secretary clinton because i met with her in august and we were proposing new sanctions in the telecommunication firms and they had google they had facebook they had lots of uh, companies that were under were blocked to work in syria at the same time, the activists in Syria were using YouTube, they are using Chrome, they are using Gmail. They would be able to use the same service even when the government are sanctioned and not using those, uh, those technology. 
And in the recent two months, Iranian government, ha unfortunately, has supplied the Syrian government with technology where they can pinpoint in the map where the satellite phone signal is coming. And they use this technology to directly bomb and kill activists, including Rami Sayed, the guy who was very famous in Bamboozer, the Swedish app that got blocked by the Syrian government. I want to hear a comment, please, on this. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so, who on the panel would like to, uh, Minister Carlson, would, would you like well, to respond to? Part I think of that? we should address this question in two parts. Well, sh first, there is no regulation. Should we have regulation? And if we have regulation, will we miss something? Because if we say that we should have a lot of restrictions, it might be also that we don't have the, all the possibilities with these new technologies. It's really hard to find the balance. Uh, we have said, and, and that's my personal point of view, that we should really try to be as open as possible. And that also means that we have to ask also sometimes the businesses to be responsible. Should everything be about regulation and on what level should they be? So that's why I think these questions are very, very tricky. Uh, but also that we know that some of these technologies is also for dual use. Uh, and that's why it's, it's really hard, because we're talking about a technology, but then the use of it. And that's why my responsibility to talking about how to combat poverty and to extend freedom is really to say that I think in this globalized world, no country can develop if they don't not allow. And that's why also to start the dialogue to make the countries themselves understanding that when they are shutting down, when they are closing off, they are really closing up also wealth creation opportunities and that's why I think we should have this double approach. And that doesn't mean double standard on human rights issues, but it means that these new technologies need to be considered on a global level how we should deal with it. And it would make no sense at all if Sweden alone not allows our companies or trying to prohibit some business activities that are not regulated today that they should be. And therefore, I think this debate is very useful and helpful, but I'm not ready that we from Sweden alone should take actions. And that's why I hope also that this internet forum could be helpful in assessing this. Yes, we have been very, very open from our point of view. Why? Because we think that the power and the opportunities with the net is so strong, so we would like to expose rather than to regulate. Can I respond as well? Sure, and I think she wanted to do too. Um, so, yeah. And in fact, I think, I mean, maybe you'd like to respond to what I want to say as well. I, I really support the, the, the European initiative, but I think we should also be realistic. You know, the demand exists um, for, for, for surveillance technologies and filtering soft software. That demand doesn't just exist in repressive regimes. That demand exists in some of the most democratic and apparently free countries in the world. Um, my organization, organization did some research into content filtering and we found that the New York Public Library was filtering websites which made it impossible for sex workers who use the New York Public Library to access the information of a sex work civil society NGO that was providing support and healthcare advice for sex workers. Now, I'm and we know from follow-up that this was not intentional, but but you know this 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 happened. So I think that that when we talk about demand and supply, we need to look at it in its in its um, full yeah. context, and and I think pressure on the corporate sector and transparency um, is absolutely vital. It's a really really good tool and a good tool for civil society and human rights advocates. But it's not enough. I think we 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 can't. And maybe Rebecca, it's you that usually say this. We can't. We can't make the private sector the arbiter and, and, and the, the, the knight on the white horse that will protect our human rights. The, the private sector is a really important partner and I think in the internet we have a particular, I think, um, mm. um, creative and, and, and um, um, degree of partnership and a lot of commonality between um, human rights advocates and, and many businesses who do have common interests. I think we, we're quite fortunate in our sector, but there are also divergent interests and we need to look at what other procedures. I think, for example, the minister mentioned conditionality when it comes to um, budget support for, for, for countries. I think that's really important. We need to look at at, um, at at a national level, restrictions, transparency, and we need to look at global human rights standards 
standards and mechanisms and how they are applied. So I think we need multiple thrusts, in, in other words. I think the demand and supply is going to be there for a long time to come. Right, so just very quickly, and, and then yes. we'll go on to the next question. No, I, I think these comments, again, uh, underline that internet freedom doesn't exist in a vacuum. It relates to a lot of other policies related to human rights, and the credibility of the EU uh, is defined by how we act ourselves. Domestically, uh, we've seen uh, suggestions in the United Kingdom after the riots to shut down certain services. We see a very big push for intellectual property rights enforcement, which in our own societies violates human rights and makes it very difficult to speak to repressive regimes. Uh, but we have to make a few distinctions. Uh, the term dual use uh, is often uh, talked about and it's become uh, such a commonly used term that we sometimes forget what it means. So dual use technologies can be used for several purposes and of course the context within which they are used determines the risk that people face when using these tools. So I think it's time to add another category uh, for systems, uh, surveillance technologies, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Uh, which we should label single use systems. Uh, there are a number of um, surveillance uh, software and, uh, and hardware systems where it's absolutely without question what they're going to be used for. Uh, there's no such thing as dual use in a number of these cases. And it would also help those industries and businesses that will not uh, seek to be engaged in repressing people to distinguish these two kinds of technologies and not put all on the same pile. Uh, and the same goes for the um, technological requirements that would enable lawful interception, which uh, all of our phones uh, have, because these are European technological standards, which allow our police services, in the context of the rule of law, to uh, use, let's say, the back door of the technologies to um, uh, tap phones of, uh, of suspected criminals or to trace the GPS um, signal of a child missing, for example. But these same technologies, with the beautiful term lawful interception, uh, do not mean the same in the context where there is no rule of law. How can we speak of lawful when we establish on the foreign uh, affairs level that there is no rule of law in a country? So we must put context and technology together in a more sophisticated way and actually look at what these terms mean in practice. And I think businesses um, do a lot of research on the ground when they're looking for their market potential. Uh, and if they uh, have difficulties knowing <coughs> where the balance is between human rights uh, uh, or uh, risks of violating them, then I think the EU should help with a help desk that businesses can consult before exporting to, uh, to places where uh, human rights might be at risk. Before we move on, this is such a hot topic that our, our Syrian friend has hit on the head. Uh, Mr. LaRue, you wanted to comment in, briefly. In just in 30 seconds. Uh, I think, and, and Marek just mentioned this a bit, but I, I think the issue of context is very important. I, I do understand that the markets will flow and the difference of technologies, and it's very difficult between responsibility of states and of corporations uh, to establish sort of very, very clear boundaries. But in, in terms of the context, I, I feel that a solution would be to have a European-wide initiative to establish some very clear benchmarks in terms of the most authoritarian and repressive regimes. Because there, it is clear that any technology that can be used for monitoring, filtering, or blocking internet will be misused and, and will be part of the repression against citizens. So, so as not to make any individual state hold that mm -hmm. responsibility to make it a European-wide initiative, which I think would serve as an example for the US, Canada, and other countries that are, are, are working on this. Mm. But it, it, and it would be the most extreme cases, Syria, North Korea, but, but I think they do have to be mentioned because otherwise um, we can't just simply say, well, the market is different than doing human rights. Okay. This gentleman's been waiting patiently. Please identify yourself briefly. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Fisahation and I'm a professor at um, Ethiopian University. <laughs> I have been a refugee for more than 30 years of my life and become very active in the area of human rights and uh, development. I have a number of questions. First, um, we talk about development, but development for whom, by whom? And um, we've talked about elimination of poverty. To be very honest, as an African, Many of African people have different needs and priorities. The priorities of Europeans and Americans is quite different. 
from the massive and un unacceptable state of poverty that persists in developing countries and particularly in Africa. So the question I want to ask is, we've been talking about access to internet, but how many people have access to electricity? How many people have, can read and write? How many people can read and write and type in, in whatever, in computers or so? So I need, what I wanted to, to express is that it's good to talk about access to um, internet, but the preconditions are not there. Another one, based on my experience, I feel we need to, to set standards for government. We need to have standards, which can, we cannot only say that we access to internet, but our governments, or governments of many African countries, their leaders are short-sighted, they are not behaving responsibility to, towards their own people. The state is being privatized, and therefore, they do whatever they like. The, the people are treated as slaves, and the country is seen as their own garden. So the point is, what do we do about this one? Another one, in the case of the Middle East, it's true, the internet has been a catalyst, has been provoking, but have they achieved what they want to achieve? This is a question which we need to ask. And about aid, dear minister, I find I have been a lot of involved in aid, but the aid that we provide is not flexible, Mr. Minister. It's not flexible, it's not adaptable, and it does not sometimes satisfy the needs for, for the, the, the very people that aid is needed for. This is true in Europe, and this is true bilateral. So I need to rethink, uh, we need to rethink on this matter. Is aid, aid being effective? Is it delivering? These are some of the issues. About, about the internet, let me come to you. If you look at many African countries, how many people have mobile? How many people have electricity? So I wanted to stress one point, and that is that our needs and priorities are not the same. And what we want is that we want you to listen to us, and we want you to help us in the way we want so that we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should we respond to that? Or do you want to take a, uh, a, a number of our panelists are, are chomping at the bit. <laughs> uh, Mr. Tuli, you, you wanted yeah. to respond. Uh, um, I, I, I'll leave the eight questions separate, but, but I'll focus on the internet. I, I'd like to suggest the internet resolves all your questions, that it finds an answer to all your questions. I think that it is naive to assume the prerequisites are not there. Today, we're over seven billion people there's six billion mobile phone connections in the world. There's electricity for six billion mobile phones around the world. 80% of Africa uses mobile phones. In Kenya, they track elephants by strapping mobile phones to their backs. You know what everybody wants that is poor? Education. I spend my time in India talking to rickshawalas. And people find it funny the amount of time I, I end up talking to rickshawalas, thinking, that's not your customer. That's 100% my customer. His motivation for the internet is because he believes that it'll help provide a better quality education for his child. Internet delivers better quality water. Internet allows you and me and everybody that can't afford the technologies of the West an opportunity to afford technologies of the West, to find solutions to those. If we empower those people with affordable access, affordable devices, I apologize if this is gonna sound like a sales pitch for what we do, but if we empower those people with affordable access and open access, it resolves all of those things. Yes, a lot of people have access to mobile phones, and that's improved the quality and the living standards of people in those markets. Access to internet will take it to the next level. Mr. Luger. Thank you very much. I, that's exactly the question I get posed all the time. I do have the, the benefit, and I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, I do be, have the benefit that I come from Guatemala, uh, one of the poorest nations in the world, and with a multicultural and linguistic diversity, where even Spanish, the, the national language, is not spoken by the majority of the population. And still, we have 13 million people, but we have 18 million mobile phones, uh, which shows that there's more than... Uh, active phones, more than a phone and a half per, per person in, in the country. 
And for the report last year, we did a series of regional consultations with the support of Sweden. And in, uh, we did for North Africa, the MENA and the Middle East region, and we did one for Sub-Saharan Africa and Johannesburg, as a matter of fact, with APC. And I remember very clearly it was the story of a woman from Cote d'Ivoire, who her father was the only person in a village who knew how to read and write. And he would receive all the mail of the village, read the village their mail, and write the responses back. And one day the mail stopped coming, because obviously there's no more mail, because now there's internet. So he learned how to go to the nearest town and to walk down to the town. And he's still the mail reader, except that now he goes and takes the notes and he goes down and writes the notes in the internet and receives the response back in the internet and comes back to the village and does it. The point that we're all making is that even in the states, in the best intention states, the result of socioeconomic rights will always be the demand of the population. And the demand of the population will only be heard if the people have the means to express them a little freely. In the past, it was newspapers, it was social media, it was community radios. In the present, it's internet. And when internet plays a role, people of Tunisia or people of Egypt express themselves and they were able to topple the dictatorship. So through internet, you can demand water, you can demand education. And as a matter of fact, there will be integral parts. Going back to the Gutenberg example, what would be education today without books? And at a moment, that was, a, was an elite privilege. What will be education in the future without internet? I don't conceive education without internet. And education will be the crucial element for everyone. So I think it's essential to understand today that the more we open internet for the use of everyone, the better chances of social and economic development for everyone there will be. The benefit of internet is that internet is an equalizer. It gives equal opportunity to all to express themselves fully. But this is why we have to break the, the element of, of privilege that internet may have. It should not be just for an intellectual or economic group of people, elite in, in any society. It should be of universal access. And I tr strongly feel that's crucial for economic and social development, but as crucial as well for, for democratic uh, regimes. Ironically, just a footnote, the cost of internet access in Africa is radically higher than anywhere else, uh, which is, of course, also bizarre, uh, bizarre and, and yes. due to all <laughs> kinds of it's not economic that and political <laughs> factors. Uh, but, uh, but, but I thought, uh, Anre, you, you mm. work a lot in, mm. in Africa. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and, and how that ties in to people's ability to exercise their rights and, and their economic rights as, as well as, mm -hmm. as their political rights? I think it is. It's still the region um, where, where we're both mobile um, and internet, mobile telephony and internet, and particularly mobile internet, is more expensive relatively than elsewhere. But it's dropping fast. And I think you see when the cost reduces um, or drops, like Kenya, a country where, where it gets to a certain level, you see the innovation and the use of, of, of internet for various, and, and mobile internet for, for various developmental oriented activities just explodes. Um, I think what you still have, though, in, in much of Africa is a policy and regulatory environment which um, does not provide the, the su sufficient regulatory pressure on operators to reduce right. costs and you don't have empowered active consumers who demand reduced costs. So I think, I mean, just, I mean, the European Union, all the, the regulatory intervention that's been necessary here and that has worked. Um, in, in Asia, you've had just pure market forces have, have often brought down costs. But in Africa, we have um, not so benevolent mobile operators who are still seizing the moment of being able to make as much profit as they can and a regulatory, a weak regulatory environment. So it's a sort of insufficient competition on the one hand and poor regulation and not enough consumer pressure. So, um, and that needs to be changed. And I think this comes back to development and what, and, and what development partnerships and aid consists um, of. I think policy is still a really important area. Policy and regulation, not just of freedom of 
of information, but also of the sector, the, the telecommunications and internet sector. But just a you know, a quick response to you. I, I understand completely where you're coming from, but the power of the internet is that it's a disruptive technology and it empowers individuals. And therefore, it, 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 it can make such a big difference in context of repression, as we've seen, and in context of poverty. And, and I think that, that what you see, particularly in countries where development is failing, economic and social development, where governments are not succeeding in addressing those questions, you see people self-empowering and innovating and, and, and coming up with solutions. And very often those solutions are driven or involve um, mobile or internet technology. So I think never underestimate the power of internet in, in, in the hands of an individual poor person, the power of information and the power of voice. So it's not enough, absolutely, but I'm a very strong advocate of not putting the running water supply before oh, the, the internet. internet. I absolutely <laughs> agree with you. I think, I think it's, it, it's more empowering yeah. in, in many ways. Great. So we're running uh, quickly short on time. Can, so can, I think can I what just we're, oh yes on the accusation sure. that we are not changing. <laughs> sure, absolutely. But well, we have 50 years now of experience of development assistance in Sweden. But I, I just wanted to underline that also our way of working are changing from the traditional donors. If you look in our portfolios today and how we have changed and asking for more about results and accountability, but also have introduced a transparency guarantee that means that everything we do from a Swedish point of view is free on the net. Just to scrutinizing, are we dealing with the people good enough or not? And of course, this takes time to change. But for the first time now, we can have more actors, we can have much more of innovation, and we can really make a difference because we now are facing individuals instead of states. And yes, 50 years of development assistance have been sometimes, what a failure, because we have probably not been able to reach the single individuals. Now we have it. And that means a lot for us as development actors, but also for the people that are out there. Now they have the power in the pocket. And it's not a stone, and it's not the money. It is the internet. And these makes a lot of difference for making people being participation, to have opportunities in business, but also in the way of being part of a global society. And I think this is so new and it's so promising. So we have to use it in a clever way. And, and I think you put it so wisely. Uh, we can't say that this is water or the internet. That's what I said in my, my introductory remarks. And we have to see this and seize this opportunity now. So um, I'm really hopeful about it. But those that do not want to change uh, will, of course, be left behind. Thank you very much for that. I've been given the signal that we're running very much short on time. I see a hand there and some hands there, so we're not going to be able to get to everybody, but the good news is this is just the first session of a two-day conference, so a lot of these themes and issues are going to continue to come up. Uh, before I go to this gentleman, I just want to check uh, with our curators to see whether there is a burning uh, issue or question quickly from the internet. What do you think? <laughs> You're going to have a good time later on reading up on, on all the comments and all the remarks. Uh, there seems to be a lot of discussion, of course, about the regulations and a critical remark from Demaxian said, without willingness to restrict the export of surveillance system, it's laughable to claim to support internet freedom. So that's, that's one of the critical voices. And just to, to tie all things up, you, you started with a quote where you said, um, without freedom of expression, I can't say who is stealing my food. And now they're posing that against the idea that there are more important things than freedom of expression, like food. So there is a, a distinct line going between those two ideas. Great. Thank you. Um, do I have uh, time for one more question or should, should I wrap up? One more. Okay, wonderful. Uh, gentlemen here, please identify yourself. Sorry. Uh, Mohammed Zamir, I'm from Bangladesh. I'm the Chief Information Commissioner. We have set up an Information Commission with an Act of Parliament and was asked to head it. Now, in the last two years, I would like to share two things, important things, when we were discussing this. As you all realize, due to the perceived aspects of national security, there is this growing uh, trend of exemptions. For example, I was recently in Washington and I found out, to my horror, that uh, the Freedom of Information Act in the USA, when it was uh, brought in in 1966, in 1974, the state of Maryland had only six exemptions. Now it has grown to 132. 
In the United Kingdom, in Britain, as you know, they have two rights of information act. One is for England, um, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and the other one is for Scotland. Now, in the case of England, they have brought in this very interesting uh, disposition where they have the NCND principle, which is neither confirm nor deny. Now, that obviously sees you know, one way of getting rid of all the problems. Now, I went on and uh, we discussed a few other things in the last, over the last year, and I found that, uh, as in the case of Bangladesh, uh, we have found out that we now have more than 85 million mobile phone users, although we are, um, in terms of uh, GDP, quite large, but not so much in per capita. But we have found out that corporate social responsibility, as practiced by the corporate sector, is an important tool for taking internet freedom forward. Now, that's not been mentioned here in that context. The second is, there's of course the question of proactive disclosure. And that is another thing which is probably missing in our discussion today. Now, proactive disclosure would pertain not only for um, the government and government agencies, but also for the non-governmental agencies. And our experience, because we have, as you know, the largest NGO in the world, which is BRAC, and the other NGO, which is Grameen Bank, which has been recognized for its very important usage of microfinance by Professor Yunus, the Nobel laureate. Now, we find that uh, although we have a very large number of uh, members of the civil society, when it comes to uh, questions being asked and proactive disclosure about their own activities, that is sometimes not available as much as one would expect it to be. So I would suggest very much that internet freedom is dependent on the technological aspect. For example, if you have a 2G and not a 3G or a 4G, the reason why Korea has moved forward so much, we heard Foreign Minister Bill talk about it, is partially because it's moved into 4G. In Singapore, they moved from 4G, they're moving soon to 5G. Now, I was recently in Singapore talking to various ministers and I'd like to share on these three critical aspects. If you're talking of internet freedom, the civil society must also not only be engaged, but be more accountable for their actions, to be taken more seriously so that credibility gaps are not identified in what they report. Number two is the importance of technology transfer in a more meaningful, responsible manner. And that, unfortunately, is not happening as much as it should. And the third is, very important, the usage of corporate social responsibility. And uh, that is totally missed out in the Middle East. I've spent 17 years of my life in the Middle East, and I think there is need for that, very much so. And that is what uh, our development partners should focus on. Thank you very much. I think uh, we may have run out of time for people to respond, uh, but uh, I, I just want to highlight um, the, the themes that we just heard that I think are going to be very critical in many of the panels and discussions going forward, um, which has to do with the idea that uh, the, the established democracies need to be setting the right example. And the lack of good examples when it comes to transparency, both on government and, and on the corporate side, is highly problematic. The importance of corporate social responsibility. We haven't gotten to that uh, heavily in this panel, but there are a number of sessions dealing specifically with that through, throughout the next two days. And, and so those of you interested in that question, I... I strongly recommend both some side sessions as well as main sessions on that. And I, I think, you know, again, the, the number of issues that have come up, I, I think this is just really the, the start of the discussion. Um, the, the issue of responsibility, the issue, the, the, the point that these are interlocking locking issues, that it's, it's very easy to say we stand for a free and open internet, but how you implement that globally how you actually put it into practice in conjunction with all these important competing interests of security, of economic development, and so on. Um, it's not easy, and I think one of the things that was emphasized both by Minister Carlson and by, by Foreign Minister Bilt and, and others is, is that the, the democratic nations are struggling uh, with, with this issue as well. 
just how we get the balance right and what the models should be. Um, and, Mr. Lure, you, you get the final absolute last word no, and then and, my and boss <laughs> here is uh, and two, urging us to Two to seconds, two words. And, and this, of any other issues, this is clearly a multi-stakeholder issue where the responsibility is on states, but we all have to engage in terms of corporate responsibility and in terms of responsibility of civil society. And I think we all have to play a role in it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the panelists. And just one final point that in addition to the main sessions, there are a lot of really fascinating side sessions going on throughout the next couple of days. I'm just going to use my, uh, abuse my position to promote the first side session that's going to be going on shortly uh, by colleagues of mine of Glo Global Voices, which is an international citizen media network. Uh, and if you really want to uh, hear the perspectives of, of people uh, who come from some of the countries that have been mentioned on this panel and what their concerns on, that's certainly one side session to make, but there are there are many others as well, so thank you very much.